All right, anatomy, here we are. We're going to study the axial skeleton today, chapter 7. And you might as well get a glass of water and sit in a comfy chair because this is a long lecture. So we are starting with looking at the axial skeleton, which consists of the skeletal uh, elements in the center of your body. The skeletal, the axial skeleton is made up of the skull, which is divided, oops, let me get my pen going, the skull, which is divided into the cranial bones and the facial bones. We are going to spend time going through all of those. Um, do you need to know them all? Yes, you do. We also have skull and uh, associated bones with the skull, which we'll get to in a little bit. The associated bones um, are much smaller. Um, the associated bones are going to be uh, auditory ossicles and the hyoid. One of the things that I will say is that the auditory ossicles we will review in better detail when we talk about the auditory system, all right? So you need to know that they're there. There are three on the left, three on the right, and uh, you know, malleus, inca, stapes, um, but we're gonna focus on that a little bit more later. The hyoid bone, which is a facial bone that is associated with your throat. Uh, after that, these three sets, okay, which are probably some of the most complex, uh, delicate, um, and some of them very difficult to see, um, after that, we'll be proceeding down to the thoracic cage and the vertebral column. The thoracic cage itself is going to be basically your rib cage. Okay, here are your ribs, right? They're intended to protect your internal organs, your delicate organs like your lungs, your heart, uh, some uh, endocrine organs. Uh, the thoracic cage is made up of the sternum. Okay, the sternum is basically this region right here, and the individual ribs, uh, 24 ribs or 12 pair, okay, and we'll talk about those later. The vertebral column is, are the bones surrounding the spinal cord, okay? So when we talk about the spinal cord, the spinal cord is actually nervous tissue extending from your brain down through uh, the dorsal portion of your body all the way down to basically your pelvis, all right? There are 24 vertebra. We have one sacrum. The sacrum is an interesting bone. I think it's one of my favorites, actually. The sacrum is a series of fused vertebra. And then at the very end, we have the coccyx, which I kind of covered up there. Uh, the coccyx, uh, which is made up of coccygeal bones, little tiny bones, but we only have a single coccyx. And by the time that we are um, adults, those little coccygeals have fused into one coccyx, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So the axial skeleton is the skull, associated bones, vertebral column, and the thoracic cage. The appendicular skeleton, which is a cha chapter eight, that is gonna be the arms, legs, and pelvis. There are 80 bones in the axial system. Do you need to know them? Sad well, not sadly, yes, you do. Why do you need to know them? Uh, first of all, it's important to know uh, all of your bones so that you know the names of whatever bone if they break, but they're also uh, markers for other parts of the body, underlying tissues and so forth. So oops, this picture that I have here is a picture that I have from another uh, uh, resource. Oops, sorry, I'm going backwards. Um, this is the picture from your book. Um, please open uh, figure 7.2 to look at the general names in your book. This is the axial and the appendicular. This part, the appendicular, we are not going to deal with right now, okay? So this is just an outline of the two. So what are the functions of the axial skeleton? The axial skeleton big time protects uh, organs in the dorsal and the ventral body cavities, but it also helps to support them. Uh, in other words, these organs are attached to some degree to uh, elements of the skeleton through connective tissues, which we'll talk about more later. Surface area for attachments of the muscles, okay? The bones give surface area to adjust the position of the head, the neck, and the trunk. And in fact, the uh, attachments, the ligaments and the uh, tendons that attach bone to bone and muscle to bone, those are uh, really big, really strong. And so bone itself has to be strong to help support those attachments. The axial system is essential for allowing respiratory movements to happen. What do I mean? When you breathe in, all right, you're sitting there right now, I would like you to put your hands on either side of your rib cage and take a big breath in. What happens to your rib cage as you breathe in? Each individual rib expands or they pull out. Now, it's not the ribs that are pulling out, it's actually the muscles that are 
contracting to allow the rib cage or thoracic cavity to expand. As that happens, that allows the lungs to expand. How do we exhale? <sighs> I hope you haven't been holding your breath this whole time. As you exhale, the ribs return back to their original shape, their original kind of um, size, I guess you would say. When they do that and the muscles are relaxing, that helps uh, air to leave the respiratory pathway. And when that happens, uh, we're able to expel carbon dioxide into the environment. So breathe in, <sighs> oxygen, room air, fill your lungs because muscle contraction allows the rib cage or the thoracic cavity to open up. Breathe out, <sighs> relaxation of the muscles allow the bones to recoil back into their original shape, allowing air to be expelled. Um, you'll learn a lot more about respiratory movement and the flow of air into the respiratory system in physiology. But for now, you need to understand that the axial skeleton, especially the uh, thoracic cavity, it, associated with the thoracic cavity, allows respiratory movements to occur, which keeps us breathing. The last thing that uh, the axial system is really good for is stabilizing um, structures of the appendicular skeleton. In other words, our arms and legs are stabilized by the center skeleton, okay, by the axial skeleton. So that's a big deal, right? That type of stabilization allows us to walk and allows us to uh, exercise our strength, our muscular strength. Some bones in the axial skeleton do have red marrow for uh, blood cell production, but uh, it's not quite as much as the appendicular skeleton. So we're going to start with the skull and the associated bones of the skull. There are 22 bones, eight form the cranium. Now, let's back up for a second. When we were talking about the uh, uh, bones of the skull and the associated bones, in the slide that I had, what we're gonna be talking about is the skull and associated 28 of these, the 29th is going to be the hyoid. So right now, I, I just with the skull, we're gonna talk about the 22 bones, okay? The cranium, the face, uh, not so much the auditory ossicles though, those are kind of separate. All right, so the cranium surrounds and protects the brain. We also call this the brain case. There are uh, a few different bones in the cranium, the occipital, uh, the parietal, you have two of those. So there's one occipital, two parietal, one frontal, right on your forehead, two temporal, one sphenoid and one ethmoid. The sphenoid and the ethmoid you don't see very obviously, they're kind of inside your skull. The joint between the occipital bone and the first spinal vertebra uh, is present, uh, is the, one of the associated bones, but we're, we'll talk about the uh, first spinal vertebra when we talk about the spinal column. So that's the cranium. Facial bones, the bones on the front of your face, protect and support structures for respiration, the digestive system, and um, sensory systems like your like vision, okay? So we have the maxilla, we have two maxilla bones, that's the top jaw. The palatine, there are two of those, that's inside of your mouth, the top, like the roof of your mouth. The nasal, you can't see very well, that's um, obviously nasal, you know, inside your uh, nose. The zygomatic, there are two of those, you can't see those. Lacrimal bones, tiny bones, uh, which you can't see, they're covered with skin, two of those. Inferior nasal concha, um, those are really interesting. Can't see those, those are deep inside your, your uh, kind of behind your nose. The vul vulmer and the mandible. So this is a lateral view of the human skull. This is one of the figures in your book. And what this is showing you out of gross anatomy are the parietal bones, the frontal bone, temporal, some of the labeled bones that I just mentioned. Uh, it's also showing you the uh, location of the brain case. So these would be the cranial bones and the facial bones, the, the front of the face. Now the parts of the skull that we're gonna be focusing on first are going to, oh, sorry, and then your anterior view. This is a lot of labeling here, and I did mention a lot of these bones, but I decided to give you a more colorful picture and a picture that has larger text on it, quite frankly. So let's look at an anterior view of the skull. The frontal bone is basically where your forehead is, all right? The parietal is right behind the frontal, and you have parietal one and parietal two, or the left and the right. Connecting the frontal bone to the parietals are the coronal sutures. We'll talk about suture structure in a little bit. 
the uh, uh, superorbital foramen, whenever you hear the word foramen, these are little holes through which nerves from the brain contact uh, either muscles, usually muscles, but there are other things that the, the nerves might be contacting. Um, uh, muscles, uh, sensory neurons in your skin, like thermal receptors, pressure receptors, and so forth, okay? The sphenoid is back here near your soft spot. The temporal bone is the back side, okay, of your skull that or your brain case. That's going to be temporal one, temporal two, or right and left. The parietal bone, okay, so oh, let's go to the ethmoid first. The ethmoid you cannot see. It is inside behind your eyeball, okay? So you need a skull to look at this. Should you choose to purchase a skull off of Amazon, try to get a skull that has colored plates. That'll really help. Uh, so that's the ethmoid. The parietal is adjacent to the ethmoid. That's the yellow bone here. So the ethmoid is green. The parietal is yellow. And again, you can't see the parietal because it's behind your eyeball. The lacrimal bone, you also cannot see because it's underneath your eye bone. Uh, the zygomatic, zygomati, ha, zygomatigo facial foramen. These are little, this is a little hole here that allows uh, a nerve to escape. And don't worry about the, what number nerve it is or the name of the nerve right now. It's a nerve that escapes through, uh, through that, through the zygomatic and the facial bone, zygomatic, zygomatic facial bone, uh, to contact muscles to allow you to smile. The zygomatic bone is everything, uh, here in the front in blue. Now the zygomatic connects back and touches the temporal bone. So this is what we call the temporal process of the zygomatic bone right here, this side. Over here is just the zygomatic. And there is a connection right here, which we might talk about later. It's the uh, frontal aspect of the zygomatic bone. The nasal bone is the top bone here in purple. There are two of them. That, uh, atta that attaches to cartilage for your nose. So if you touch your nose and you wiggle it around, the wiggly stuff is the cartilage. You'll get to a point, if you follow your, the piece of cartilage around, which we'll talk about in a little bit, back to a hard piece of bone, that is your nasal bone, okay? The maxilla is your top jaw. You have maxilla one and two, or right and left. The inferior nasal concha are these little bones inside. It's blue here and blue here. There are other nasal concha that we'll talk about in a little bit. It's a tissue. Um, this is where we have lots and lots of um, epithelial tissue that secretes a thin mucus. Hopefully it's thin, right? Um, and it allows, a, it protects us from incoming particles in the environment, all right? It allows us to trap those particles and uh, the mucus lubricates the tissue, keeps it moist, uh, catches those particles and allows us to uh, transport or allows the tissue to transport it back to your pharynx where you can swallow it. The mental foramen down here is, yes, another hole through which a nerve escapes. Don't worry about that right now. The lower, the jaw itself, the lower jaw is the mandible. The mental protuberance is the tip of your chin. All right, and the other bone that I hadn't mentioned yet is the vulmer. You can't see this because it's deep inside of your nose. Up here, the frontonasal uh, suture is the suture or the connection between the frontal bone and the nasal bone. The optic canal is a region where the optic nerve travels back to the brain. The superior orbital fissure is uh, another region where you're going to um, see a connection between the interior of the uh, brain case and the eye. The inferior orbital fissure is just a smaller spot. Don't worry about what's coming in and out of there. We talked about the temporal process of the zygomatic bone, the intraorbital foramen as well. Uh, oh, wait, no, I didn't mention that one. The intraorbital foramen, ah, sorry, my phone's ringing. The intraorbital foramen is another spot where a large nerve comes out uh, for innervating uh, muscles of the face. Uh, the middle nasal concha, right here. There's a superior concha that you can't see here. And then the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid is a piece of the bone that hangs down. What will you need to know about all of this for the exam? Pretty much you're going to need to know how to name all of them. Um, how is that going to happen? I may present you with this picture and say identify number one, two, three, four, and five. And I might not give you a whole lot of time to do it 
you're just going to need to know what they're named. So here's another uh, picture showing you a lateral view of the skull and the relationship among the different bones. So here, for example, is the, the zygomatic bone in green. The zygomatic process is the, basically your cheekbone. And then you have like the, later, the temporal aspect of the zygomatic process and so forth over here. Um, but I, I like the other picture a little bit more because it shows you maybe a little bit more defined detail. This kind of more pastel version, I, I don't know, I can't see all the bones in the nose as well. So here's a brighter colored uh, representation. So again, cranial bones in the back of the skull, back here facial bones in the front, parietal, two of those, temporal, two of those, frontal, one of those, occipital, one of those, okay. The sphenoid wraps around, and the ethmoid, you can't see it very easily. I mean, you can't actually see it in a living human. It's on the inside of your skull, on the, you know, you'll see the ethmoid right here, okay. So uh, we're going to look at the, we already looked at the eight cranial bones. We already looked at the 14 facial bones, but this breaks it apart a little bit more easily. Instead of looking at this real busy figure, you can also learn to label this figure as well. So the cranial bones, the occipital itself is posterior. It's in the back. It's lateral and inferior to other skull surfaces. The large hole, the foramen magnum, is what allows the spinal cord to escape the uh, cranial cavity. Okay, It connects the cranial cavity to the spinal cavity, in fact. The occipital condyles are the little articulating feet uh, that contact the first cervical vertebra. In other words, the occipital condyles, they're not feet really, they're kind of like little spots where the two bones touch and there's a little bit of um, cartilage there to keep them from rubbing one another. Uh, the condyloid fossa are depressions underneath the condyles that allow for articulation and smooth movement. And the external occipital protuberance is a bump on the middle of the foramen that attaches to a, a connective tissue. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The jugular foramen is formed by the occipital itself, and this is where the jugular vein passes. This is uh, where the vein can bring blood out of the uh, brain case for return to the heart. The hypoglossal canals start just superior to the condyles. Now, this particular picture is a picture from your book, and it's showing you uh, a cross section through the skull, okay, looking at the anterior, crani anterior cranial fossa, so the, kind of a bump there, uh, the middle cranial fossa, another bump where the brain sits, the posterior cranial fossa. That exterior portion is going to be overlying. Here's the uh, foramen magnum where the spinal cord goes through. So if you're looking at the outside, that's the posterior cranial fossa over here, and that would be close to articulating with the first spinal vertebra. So the occipital bone, looking from the outside, Here's the foramen magnum, the occipital condyle right here. So this is part of what's going to be contacting the first uh, spinal vertebra. Hypoglossal canal right here. Uh, condyloid fossa, another little kind of joint area. Inferior, uh, nu uh, it's not a CH, it's knuckle, nuchal line. The exterior occipital crest, this is kind of this little V shape upside down for us right now. The superior nuchal line and the exterior external occipital protuberance, which is this, here I need to erase this now, which is this little region right here. This again is going to become important in a few minutes when we talk about connective tissue holding the skull onto the spinal column and allowing us to like look down, look up, and so forth. So that's the occipital bone, the exterior view, the external view. Internally, forma magnum is in the same place. Here's the jugular notch. Look at that huge old hole there. The groove for the uh, sigmoid sinus is right here. Entrance, entrance to the hypoglossal canal right here. All right. The fossa for the cerebellum. So fossa is a depression. Okay. It's not a hole necessarily. It's a depression. The internal occipital crest is this region right here, and it's kind of a 
It's elevated compared to the fossa, it's separating the two hemispheres of the brain. The fossa for the cerebrum right here, okay, the cerebral fossa. Um, the fossa again is a depression. And then the uh, internal occipital protuberance is, let me erase this, right here. Now, in terms of the parietal bones, that was the occipital bone, the bone on the back of your head, right? The parietal bones are on the side, upper side. So like on the top of your head, the superior inferior temporal lines are uh, basically running along the side of your head, okay? Right here, we have the border of the sagittal suture, and you'll see that it's a kind of a zigzag line. All the sutures in our skull are little zigzags, and the sutures themselves have lots of connective tissue joining one skull plate, or in this case, the parietal bone, to another parietal or the temporal or the occipital, okay? Here's the border of the squamous suture down here. What these do are they allow slightly flexible joinings. These are actual joints. These sutures are a type of joint. They're joinings that allow some pressure on the skull so that you can have a little bit of compression of the skull without damaging the brain. The parietal eminence is smooth, round surface. Okay, so that's this kind of smooth, rounded part of the parietal bone. Um, the frontal bone, so here's the front. The frontal bone you'll see is real you know, smooth along the front. The um, squamous part, the squamous surface, it doesn't look squamous like the squamous, squamous epithelium. Basically, it's just a smooth surface. The suborbital margins are the top of basically the orbit where the eye resides, okay? The suborbital notch, let me erase this one little line. The suborbital notch is this little notch here. There are two of them. Uh, so the margin is the smooth line. The notch is the little V in here. So we'll find those over here as well. There's the suborbital margin. Here's the notch. Okay. Uh, the superciliary arch is this top region here. Superior temporal line is right through here. And so the ridges above the margins are what we call the superciliary arches, which is what I was pointing out right here. Okay, the superciliary arches are basically, they would be basically just behind or just superior to your eyebrows. The frontal sinuses are not visible from the exterior view. You have to look at the inside of the um, frontal bone to see the, well, you actually have to kind of buzz them, buzz through them to see that. So here's the frontal bone when we slice it. Here is the uh, superorbital foramen, okay, another little region there. Superorbital margin right here, lacrimal fossa. Here are the frontal sinuses. The frontal sinuses are, so like you would have the eyeball right here, and another eyeball right here. The frontal sinuses are adjacent to uh, the eyeballs, okay? And then you have, yeah, the orbital surface, the orbital part. Here's the margin of the coronal suture. Uh, the squamous portion, the squamous portion is just kind of the bone, okay? The frontal crest, this is a separation between the right and the left uh, cerebrums. The orbital part, this is where, again, the eyeball is going to be here and here. And this is the ethmoid notch. This is where you're going to find the ethmoid bone, when the ethmoid is attached to the frontal bone. So when we look at the back, the posterior view of the skull, we can see the association again between or among the parietal bones, the occipital, the temporal, the um, mastoid process. You can also see the, um, the mandible down here on the bottom. When we focus on this particular pic picture, which I actually like in your book a little bit more, even though I don't care for the pastel colors so much, you can see the sutures really well. So you are going to need to know, oops, let me go back one, the names of the sutures. So the suture between the um, occipital bone and the parietal bones are, is called the lamboid suture, okay? We also have uh, these little occipital condyles right here that you need to know about. Uh, we've already talked about the nuchal line. 
part, pardon me. And then you have the sagittal suture. The sagittal suture separates the brain or the brain, the skull in right and left sides. And the lamboid suture right here and here kind of gives you a Y shape. Okay. The temporal bone does have a separate suture with the parietal, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So over here, um, again, going back to another uh, section through the skull uh, that's in your book, um, the midline, when you cut sagittally through the midline, you can now see the association among the parietal bone, the frontal bone, the um, occipital bone, and the interior of the temporal bone. The interior of the temporal bone has this little hole in it. And if we go back a couple slides, or a lot of slides maybe, all right, we'll get to that in a minute. That's the internal acoustic meatus. On the exterior of the skull, you'll have the external acoustic meatus, and that's the, basically the auditory canal, the hole that lets sound in and out, okay? So the temporal bones, let's talk about what's going on with the temporal bones. So right over here, let's come back here. This whole purple region on this slide is the temporal bone, and you have two of those. We have the zygomatic process externally. So the zygomatic process, mastoid process, external auditory or acoustic meatus, you can use either term, okay? These are external. This is internal because, you know, internal auditory um, uh, or acoustic meatus. We have a styloid process, styloid, sty I'll get to the squama in a minute, styloid process, stylomastoid foramen, mandibular fossa, the uh, carotid canal, and the uh, petrous portion. The squama is that squamous appearance. Again, it is not a squamous epithelium, it's just the smoothness. Let's look at each of these elements on the temporal bones. So here's a, a satchel view of the exterior portion. <clears throat> Here is the external acoustic meatus, the ear hole, basically. The mastoid process and the styloid process, you'll always be able to see the styloid process. It's like this little finger that extends out underneath, or I guess you'd say inferior, to the external acoustic meatus. You have the articular tubercle. This is going to be a point of attachment for uh, tendons for your jaw muscle. And then the zygomatic process. This is a part of your cheekbones right here okay um the mastoid air cells which are interesting these are um basically big holes in the bone the purpose of this is to lighten up that region okay we also have the tympanic part of the external ac uh, acoustic meatus or auditory meatus um, the tympanic part is where you'll find the tympanic membrane or the eardrum now when we come over here and we look at the underside all right we looked at, so basically your this would be your jaw you're looking from underneath the skull here's the uh articular tubercle okay we saw that right here it's actually a much broader space than you can see over here associated with the zygomatic process here is the external acoustic meatus here's the carotid canal allowing the uh, carotid to come in and out of the brain Here's the styloid process. All right, so the styloid process sticks down when you're looking at the lateral view here. Okay, I guess it's kind of sagittal, lateral. Um, here's the mastoid process and the mastoid foramen. You can't see the mastoid foramen super well here. Um, don't worry about that too much. Um, we have the jugular fossa and the stylomastoid foramen right here. Now, when we look interiorly, so these are both exterior views. Okay, exterior, and this one's an exterior view as well. When we look from inside of the skull, the squamous part is kind of that real smooth cerebral surface. In other words, that's the part that touches the tissues of the brain, the, um, the meninges, okay? Here's the zygomatic process, which you're familiar with right here, the cheekbone. Here's the internal acoustic meatus. So this is what's going to be uh, behind the tympanic membrane, okay, or the eardrum. And then here's the mastoid process and the styloid process here. So just to look at a drawing of the temporal bone, you're looking at the external uh, components of the temporal bone. A great thing that you could do between this picture and this picture is looking at the live picture. If you have the ability to draw on your uh, 
computer, that would be great. Draw on your screen. Uh, label them on the drawing here, okay? So hide each one of these and try to label them. All right, now let's talk about the sphenoid. The sphenoid you can't see very easily. This, in fact, you can't see the sphenoid at all. Uh, the sphenoid is going to be inside and it actually forms um, the, the palate, okay? Basically the roof of your mouth. So you have the stellar uh, uh, turkia, tercia, turkia, sorry, the lesser wings and the greater wings, the foramen roundum, the foramen ovule, the foramen spinosum, the sphenoid sinus and the, uh, the I always get this one right, uh, the pterichoid process. So where are all these things? So the body of the sphenoid is the big, thick region here. The only thing is it's not solid. It's actually hollow. That's the sphenoid sinus. So those are the sinuses that are like right behind where your nose is. Here's the lesser wing. Here is the greater wing, all right? This is the orbital surface of the greater wing. In other words, your eyeball sits anterior to the sphenoid. So the eyeball is in front, okay? Let's pretend that's an eyeball. Yes, I know, my outstanding art, right? Make an iris, sort of, whatever. All right, right here is the superior orbital fissure. And then another greater wing, so you have right and left. The foramen uh, uh, rotunum, the pterichoid process is this whole lower leg. And you have a right and a left. Okay, this is the right, this is the left. Remember, right and left is referenced to your patient. And right now, this sphenoid bone is my patient. Here's the lateral palate, and this is the medial palate, or plate. It's part of the palate, though. When we look at the superior surface, the inside. Okay, so right here, you're looking at the anterior, the front. The superior surface, you're looking from the top of the head, okay? So this is the, the greater wing right here. This is the orbital surface, okay? So you see right here an eyeball here. Here's the foramen ovule, the foramen roundum, the anterior coracoid process. This comes up. See how they come up like this? You have the optic groove, uh, the ter uh, tuberculum stella. Um, it looks kind of like a star, it's a stella, you know. Foramen, foramen spinosum, the middle uh, clinoid process, the posterior clinoid process here in the back, dorsum stella, stella uh, trinica, um, and then you have this region here to the optic canal, all right? Um, Unfortunately, we're not able to see this in person. Looking at a sphenoid bone is really a big part of anatomy in the lab. Um, the best thing that I think you guys could do is really study these two slides in great detail. So what you're looking at here is the anterior surface. You're looking straight on. And up here, right here, that's what you're looking at here. And so over here, uh, again, are some drawings of the sphenoid. One of the great things about this picture is it's showing you where the sphenoid is if you look on the inside of the skull, okay? So here's the superior view, what we were just looking at. And then uh, we looked at the anterior view. This is the posterior view. I don't have a, an actual picture of the posterior view. That's another reason why I put this figure in here. Greater wing, lesser wing up here on top, superior orbital fissure, uh, the pterichoid uh, plates, you have the, the lateral and the medial. Uh, and of course, because you're looking at the posterior view, you can't see where the eyeball is here. So now we're going to go on to the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid, a lot of times, this is deep in your nose, basically. It's, ba it's back behind the cartilage of your nose. Um, it's made up of a few different plates. The cribriform plate right here is basically where the olfactory nerves extend uh, down into the sinus cavity or into basically your... Um, your it's not a sinus actually it's the uh, respiratory pathway um, and those nerves there are what are detecting odorants odorant molecules so the cribriform plate uh, or the cribriform uh, contains cribriform foramina foramina are the in are the individual holes the individual foramen the cristigalli 
is the uh, they call it the the coxcomb or the ridge. The it's this little pointy thing that sticks up. Okay, it the coxcomb meaning like a rooster's comb on top of its head. The perpendicular plate is the bottom side of the Christe Galle. So that's the top. This is the bottom side going down, separating the right from the left sides of the uh, respiratory pathway, or it's basically a part of, it's not the nasal septum itself, but it's a part of it. Um, the that's our perpendicular plate, the olfactory uh, foramina, what I already talked about. We have the superior, the middle, uh, and the inferior nasal concha, which you're, you can't necessarily see here. The superior nasal concha are going to be over here. These uh, superior up here, sorry. They attach to this region right here. The middle concha are right here. They're called concha because they're coiled when you look at a cross section of the face, which I'll show you in a minute. And then we have the ethmoid sinus. Um, <clears throat> Pardon me, and you can't see that in this picture here, but when we come over here, we have the superior view from the top, so you can actually see uh, the cribiform plate, okay, uh, the foramina, the individual foramen, and then here's the posterior view, the view from the back, okay, so you can associate with these bones the uh, artist rendition here of the uh, different elements of the ethmoid. One of the things that I would mention again is this is a big part of anatomy lab. Um, it's, it's difficult to see the fine detail in these pictures. Uh, the, the drawing is very good actually, but it's definitely different to hold this bone and to rotate it and look at it and look at superior, inferior, posterior, anterior. Okay, and to look at the characteristics and imagine where this fits inside the skull. So here's a drawing from your book showing where the cribiform plate is, the crista galley. Come up here, the crista galley looks really small, but in our drawing it's very pronounced. In different individuals it will look different. Here is the inferior, superior, right? Here's the perpendicular plate, which actually isn't connected to the superior, uh, the crystal galley, but they look like an extension of one another when you look at it this way, when you look at the uh, nasal concha associated. Um, these are the ethmoid air cells. These are not sinuses. These are just gaps that lighten the bone. Uh, here's the medial wall to the orbit. So in other words, oops, my apologies. This is where the eyeball would be here and here, okay? And then looking at the lateral view, now you can see the superior, middle, and inferior concha. Each one of these little regions here, these little, they look like little folds. They have tissue associated with them, and that tissue is what produces all of that mucus and sniffy stuff that we uh, inhale in when you inhale. So sorry about that if it sounded gross, but you know, I was hoping that you could hear a little bit of mucus. Lovely, right? But that's where the mucus is coming from. And it's trapping environmental particles, dust, pollens, things like that, and allowing us to swallow them so that we don't, uh, so they don't get clogged in our respiratory pathway. Um, moving on to the maxilla, which is your top the top of your jaw. The maxilla, uh, there's a right and a left side. They are, they do articulate with other facial bones. Um, they, with all other facial bones, actually, except for the mandible, which is your lower jaw. They don't articulate. The, the maxilla actually does not articulate with the mandible, which is kind of funny, right? We have the orbital rim here, the lower orbital rim. That's where the uh, eye, you know, where the eye would be, the intraorbital foramen right here, which is underneath the orbital rim. Remember, foramen is a place where usually nerves can travel through. Uh, the alveolar process, which are down here. These little alveolar processes are important because they overlie where our teeth erupt. Um, the incisive fossa, the palatine process, maxillary sinus, Maxillary sinus is huge, actually. That's a big sinus behind your, well, it's kind of superior to your hard palate, which is the roof of your mouth right here. This is one of the places that uh, sinus infections build because 
gravity pulls fluid down from, you guessed it, the contra sometimes. Some, sometimes you can get fluid in those sinuses. Here's the sphenoid sinus here. Over here is the zygomatic, um, sorry, not the zygomatic process. This is the maxillary sinus. And so fluid can get in there. Bacteria, if you have bacteria in that fluid, the bacteria are thrilled to be in here because the bacteria can multiply and it's a nice, warm, isolated spot where they can build their uh, population. And then you end up with a sinus infection. The palatine bone is the bone of, they're, they're kind of weird. I think they're kind of weird. They're what they call L-shaped bones, and they articulate with maxilla, the uh, top of the mouth, all right? The, they articulate also with the sphenoid, the ethmoid, and part of the orbit. So here's the orbital process here. Uh, the perpendicular plate is adjacent to uh, the ethmoid. You have the conchal crest right here. So this is lateral to the um, nasal concha. The horizontal plate uh, is superior to the palate right here. So the palatine bones are basically going to be, basically here's your nose right here, right here and right here. The external nares will be right here, right here. The holes that you breathe air in through are right there. Looking at the actual bones, uh, the actual bones are a little bit confusing to look at if you ask me. I'm gonna see if I can erase these two. Of course not. Why would I be able to erase those? You know, I'm still learning technology. <sighs> All right, so here's the ethmoid crest. Uh, you're looking at the, the medial view, view. So you're looking this way at this bone, okay? The contral crest, which is right here, and then the horizontal plate. Over here, you're looking at a lateral view. On this picture, you're looking here. So this right here is B, and this region here is picture C. So linking all of these together, we have the external and internal views of the skull and the facial bones, all right? So this is the external view here. This is kind of a hard figure to look at again, partly because it is um, pastel colors, but also because in this slide, this figure is really small. I would encourage you to please look in the uh, e-text to get a more detailed view of this. You can see the vulmer. The vulmer we haven't talked about yet, but the vulmer is um, associated with the palatine bone. Here, you're looking at the ethmoid bone, all right? Uh, you're looking at a transverse section through the skull, so you're looking interior and you're looking down. So this is a superior view. Here you're looking up. Here's the foramen magnum. So that's an inferior view. Now, finally, for the nasal bones, um, I was talking about the uh, maxillary sinus and the uh, inferior, uh, middle, and superior nasal concha. What they did here was they took a coronal section, a slice through a, a prepared skull, and they did this so that we can see where the uh, air cells are and where the sinuses are, and we can look at the nasal concha. The reason why these are called concha is because they have curves. So here's the superior nasal concha, just dips down, the middle, and the inferior nasal concha. And when I was talking about the epithelial membrane, the epithelial membranes are on the exterior surface of each of these concha, and they're producing lots and lots, again, of mucus, which allow us to uh, push any sort of debris that we've inhaled back into our um, the back of the throat where we can swallow it. Up here, here's the ethmoid air cell. Here's the cranial cavity right here, so the part of the brain would be here. The frontal sinus is right here above the eye. We have the maxillary sinuses right here. Okay, the big sinuses that are under your eyes. This is where you tend, this is where people tend to get sinus infections. All right. Here is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid separating the right and left sinus cavities. Okay, and the right and the left um, sides of the uh, respiratory pathway, the upper respiratory pathway. You can see the maxilla here, the top jaw. The mandible is down here. This is the tongue, which is just a really big um, muscle. The vulmer is down low here, 
close to the inferior nasal concha. Uh, this is the right orbit or eyeball. And you can see the orbital ridges right here and here. The lacrimal bones are dinky little tiny bones on the interior of the orbit. All right, these lacrimal bones you can't see. Uh, they're called lacrimal bones because the, uh, that's where the lacrimal glands are sitting right there. Here's the lacrimal sulcus, which is a little depression through which the lac lacrimal duct extends. We have the uh, nasolacrimal canal right here, which drains into our sinuses. The maxillary bone, which you're familiar with, the palatine bone right here. We have the frontal bone up here. Here's our supraorbital arch, the outside of the orbit here. We have the zygomatic bone here. The zygomatic process would be extending off in this direction. Uh, the sphenoid right here, the internal and external um, components of the sphenoid. Uh, so basically with the vulmer, what we're dealing with is a small region, right here's the vulmer, it's a small region, uh, it's the inferior, it's not small actually, it's a large region, I should say, that supports the cartilage um, that separates the right and the left side of the nasal um, structures, all right? Uh, the cartilage is connected to the palate, um, sorry, the vulmer. Um, and so basically, the cartilage is going to be the septum separating the right and the left hand sides. So when we're looking at the vulmer right here, you can imagine a piece of cartilage separating this internal structure, sorry, which would be the left side of the patient. Okay, so this is all left. And so we would have a piece of cartilage separating the two and that would be the nasal septum. Right here, we're looking at a picture of the maxillary bone. I should have put this a little earlier. I just wanted you to see where the foramen, the alveolar processes and so forth were. And then right here, we're looking at another picture of the bones of the orbit, the bones of the eye basically, and highlighting where the foramen are, the supraorbital foramen, um, the infraorbital foramen, so supraorbital on top of the orbit, infraorbital underneath the orbit and so forth. The mandible, the lower jaw is made up of the body, the ramus, and the angle regions. So the body is most of this region here, okay? We have the head, which is part of the articulation process. We have the mandibular arch, which is, I mean, an arch we usually think of as like this, right? This is a, an inverted arch here. It's a part of the articulation. The ramus is a region here where there's some connective tissue uh, attaching some muscles. Here's the angle right here. The mental foramen, another little hole through which nerves can escape. The uh, mental protuberance, that is basically your chin. Individual teeth, which we'll talk about later. And then the mylohyoid bone or line, not bone, line right here. So what do you need to know about all of this? We will eventually talk a little bit about the muscles of the face. So you do need to know where like the ramus is, the angle, and start identifying and recognizing these little bone markings because this is where you're gonna see connections to muscles. Here's another uh, drawing of the mandible so that you could look at uh, different features. Uh, sometimes it's easier again to look at a drawing. And then the nasal septum, I should have had this farther forward because it's associated with the vulmar bone right here. Here is the septal cartilage. The septal cartilage is what you feel when you wiggle your nose around, all right? That central cartilage separating the right and the left side. So the sinuses themselves, here are the, here's the frontal sinus right up here, the sphenoid sinus right here in yellow, the ethmoid sinuses, and then the maxillary sinuses. And then the last of the skull bones is the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is, is pretty easy. You only have one of these. There's the body, which is in the front. This is the lesser bone, uh, horn, sorry, and this is the greater horn. This uh, different elements of the hyoid bone uh, allow the suspension of, let's say the tongue or the move, uh, atta attach the tongue so that the tongue can move and allow us to speak and allow us to swallow things. Uh, the hyoid bone is inferior to the skull and it is held onto uh, the rest of our body via ligaments. There is no articulation with any other bones. 
It only holds on through ligaments. It's an anchor point. So the hyoid bone is um, superior to the larynx. And the hyoid, when you look from the anterior view, from the front, you have the body. Here's the lesser horn and the greater horn. When you look laterally, you can see that the greater horn extends far back from the lesser horn. Okay, I'm going to separate this lecture into two pieces because this is a really long lecture. We've done the skull and the axial. Well, we haven't completed the axial, but we've done the skull and the bones of the face. In a separate lecture, I will do uh, the vertebral column, the thoracic cavity, and so forth.